Yo ho ho! So today I'm going to be talking you through all the books that I read during spring. So I had a really productive reading period during this time and I think it's purely because I was procrastinating from doing my college work. I was finishing up my last semester, finishing my thesis and all my assignments and I just didn't want to do it so I decided to read 12 books instead. And at the end of the day it did me the world of good because it didn't affect my grades and it just gave me that peace of mind, you know, that relaxing chill out time that I really really needed. So anyway, let's get into the books. So the first book that I read was South and West by Joan Didion. I picked this up purely because of the length because I knew I'd get through it quite quickly and I knew that most likely I'd enjoy it. So this is Joan Didion being sent out to cover the Patty Hearst trial and then it's her thoughts on the South. Like she travels through Alabama and Louisiana and all these Southern states. And ultimately it wraps up with her going back to California and her thoughts on California because that's where she lives. If you've read any Joan Didion, you know how much she loves California and writing about it. And there's something that I just really enjoy reading reading about like um like California and Americana and all that kind of like nostalgia from the 60s and 70s um especially from someone who's like such an incredible writer I just really enjoy it but I will say that probably The White Album and Slouching Towards Bethlehem are still my two favorites that I've read of her so far um but this like didn't disappoint me but it was really short and sweet. Next I read Battle Royale by Koshin Takami so this is probably one of my favorite books that I've read so far this year. This was like almost a five star read for me. In reality I probably should have just given it five stars because I loved it so much. It was an absolute binge read and if you are someone who's like hasn't picked up a book in a really long time or you're going through a reading slump or you just want to get back into reading, you need something to like light the fire under your ass, read this. It is such a thrill ride. It's over 600 pages and I got through it in like two or three days. Uh, because I was just that addicted to it. So it is about a group of children who are on a supposed field trip and when they're on the bus they are knocked out by some sort of gas and when they wake up they're on an abandoned island and they're told that they are in a government program where they basically have to kill off one another and the last person standing is the winner and gets to go home. So it's incredibly violent, it's really brutal. I didn't expect it to be as like graphic as it was but you know what I was loving it, like I did not care. Um, the students also have these collars around their necks that will basically make their head explode if they try to escape the island. The island is sectioned off into different areas so there's forbidden areas so basically it means that a student can't just pick one area to hide out during the whole entire thing and just be the winner at the end by default. Uh, they have to constantly keep on the move and each chapter covers uh, a different student and that way you know what's happening all around the island and like where people are and stuff. There's also a map in here as well so you have a kind of visualisation of where everyone is and what's going on and all that kind of thing which is really handy for someone like me because I have a hard time visualising things at certain points. Also what's really great about this and I think this is why I got through it so quickly is that I was a bit cheeky when I was reading it at night time when I was getting ready to like go to sleep and put the book out for the night. I would flip to the end of the next chapter to see how many students were remaining because it will tell you the total of how many students are still alive and if it was zero I'd be like okay it's time to go to sleep but if it was like three I'd be like okay just one more chapter. <laughs> what I really liked about this is the fact that you kind of root for everyone at least that's what I was doing but at a certain point you get down to the core people and you really decide okay like yeah I like these people or I really don't like these people but even at a certain point I was rooting for a Mitsuko because like I like a badass bitch, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, it was just such a thrill ride. I absolutely recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it yet. Next, I read Heroes and Villains by Angela Carter. So uh, this was like one of my first books that I read this year that I was like, eh. I ended up not being a huge fan of it because on paper it sounded like a me book. It's a post-apocalyptic story about a girl called Marianne who is the daughter of a professor. So basically what's happened is that there's been some sort of global catastrophe and the intellectuals of the world have all gathered together and they've gone off and built their own society and then everyone else who's left are referred to as savages and they're basically people who would just kind of like live in the wild or live in the old abandoned houses that are still around and they've formed their own sort of community. Basically Marianne decides that she's kind of sick of her life and she's sick of always being so sheltered and not knowing the real world and she decides to go off and uh, join this other community of people but it doesn't really work out for her and ultimately like what was interesting is that like none of the characters are particularly likable and that's not something that I struggle with like if people aren't likable that's 
just the way it is. I don't really rate my books based on that, on likability. It's definitely more of a commentary than it is um, a story. It's definitely trying to tell you something about like how we are as a society and how we look at one another and all that kind of thing. But there was also things about this that I just didn't like. There was like a rape that was used as character development. It left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth and I was really looking forward to it. And overall, I just felt like it was a story that just felt unsatisfying by the time I got to the end of it um, and it was somewhat predictable. Probably one of the most disappointing reads of the year so far. Then I read On the Road by Jack Kerouac so I'd been meaning to read this for absolute years and I finally got to it. This is the original scroll though so um, I don't, I've never read the like regular On the Road. I don't know how different it is but this has no chapter breaks in it. I think I ended up giving this three stars but I feel a bit iffy about it because there was things about it that I really liked but there was other things that I really disliked. So one of the things and I've said this before is that my brain will pick out patterns while I'm reading so um, in this there's a lot of really short sentences meaning there's like three words and then a full stop or four words then a full stop so it kind of read to me like a telegram. Once my brain recognized that pattern it was really really hard to ignore it and I found it really distracting. So I think everyone knows the story of the road but basically it's about a couple of lads who just go out and kind of crumb bum around and go back and forth between different states in America. First of all let me just say these kind of stories stress me out like no end. I hate when a character decides to like go to a different state or go across the country or go to a different country and they don't have a penny in their pocket and they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there, but I'll figure it out. Oh, gives me so much secondhand anxiety. I hate it. Um, and what was interesting about this is that I thought this was just going to be like one road trip, like one long road trip of them getting in a car and driving through all these different states and ultimately ending up in California or something like that. But it wasn't that. It was them kind of going back and forth between different states and like going from like New York to Chicago and then back to New York. And I was kind of surprised by that. It wasn't like a really lin linear story like I was expecting. There was also certain characters that I really just didn't like or at least they did things that I didn't like. Like I couldn't stand Neil Cassidy picking up girls and then abandoning them and you know taking them to different states and then like driving off without them. It's just kind of ah oh, it's so cruddy. Overall like I read it quite quickly. I thought when I started reading this that this is going to be something that I was going to be reading for like a month and a half but I read it in a week or so. Um, I think I was just determined to get through it and I figured if I read it fast enough I'd retain more information but unfortunately that hasn't really happened as you can tell from how I'm talking about it. I wasn't blown away by this. I'm disappointed that I'm not one of those people who's like it's going to change your life. You have to read it. All it did was kind of stress me out. The next book that I picked up was Vile Bodies by Evelyn Waugh. So this was interesting because I didn't actually know that much about it. Like I thought I had a good idea of what it was about but when I started reading it I was like oh okay. So it's a satire about bougie sort of lifestyle um, and it starts out with a man called Adam who's a writer and he's traveling to a different country and he's working, he's been working on this book and the book is taken from him in the customs. It's just seized from him. So immediately like he's screwed right off the bat and it's just the story of like Adam trying to maneuver his way through society and um, he's engaged but his, his the, the woman he's engaged to is very iffy and she's very shallow and where she is in society is very important to her and she wants to maintain that or work her way up even further. So a lot of the characters in this are based on stereotypes which I found quite amusing and I really enjoyed how some of the dialogue was written. Uh, there was like one back and forth between Adam and um, a man who's also trying to impress Adam's fiance and just like their kind of insult match I just found very amusing. But at a certain point, this novel takes a very dark turn. Like the tone of it just changes drastically from being like a light, fun satire to something that's way more serious. And I found that very off-putting as I was reading it. Like it, it's jarring, I found. And when I finished it, I decided to look up like, why did the story end like that? And it turns out that Evelyn Waugh, his marriage started to break down while he was writing it and that's why the tone of the novel shifted so dramatically. It's because he kind of put his own feelings into it of what was going on in his life. Yeah, so I thought that was quite interesting and I'm happy to know the reason why it shifted so dramatically but ultimately I was kind of like let down by that ending. I thought even though there is a lot of foreshadowing I suppose, um, I always have a sort of like an idea that like, yeah, I want this to end a certain way. Um, and when it didn't, I was kind of like, 
But yeah, I did really enjoy it. And I've always wanted to read this because I know David Bowie was super inspired by it and it even inspired some of his songs. So I was like, yeah, I have to read Foul Bodies. The next book I read was Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. So this is the first Thomas Hardy novel I've ever read and it was everything I expected it to be and more. This was so much fun to read. There was so much drama in it. I was not prepared for like how far it escalated, but I I just... I lapped it up. I absolutely loved it. So this is about a young woman named Bathsheba who moves in with her aunt at her aunt's farm and she basically has to start running it and she's not too happy about it, but you know, that's the way it is. She meets the local shepherd and all about handyman Gabriel Oak and uh, they start a nice friendship. They don't really seem to like each other at first, but eventually, you know, they break the ice and she realizes that she she needs to rely on him. Then uh, two other men enter. Uh, the situation, Baldwood and Sergeant Troy, and basically they're all three of them would like to enter a relationship with Bathsheba, but then she's also like an independent woman who doesn't really need a man, but then, you know, you know, everyone likes a bit of company. So you're kind of wondering like who she's going to end up with. And the person she ends up with, I was pissed. I was pissed because let me tell you, there is like people plotting against each other, plotting revenge. Um, There's like murder. There's just like all the buzzwords that I typically like reading about were in this. And it was just like one thing after another, after another. And I was just like, oh my God, like poor Bathsheba. Like at the end of the day, she didn't want any of this. And now she's just in the middle of it. People are fighting over her. It's, it's a, it's a rough one, but my God, it was so much fun. And the ending was super satisfying. I was just really happy with it overall. I was just like, yeah, like this novel took me places. It was one of those ones that when I was reading it, I was like audibly gasping or, you know, having like visceral reactions to it, you know? So that's how I know it's like well-written when I when it provokes me enough to actually react in real life. Next, I reread The Hobbit. So if you remember, I was talking about how when I read this initially, I would have been like 11 or 12. I read it when I was like in fifth or sixth class. I remember that I did read it, but I didn't remember any of the plot really. Like I had a huge blank spot for this. So when I was reading it, I was thinking this is probably gonna be like, I'm gonna be reading it for the first time again and it wasn't. There were certain paragraphs in this that immediately triggered memories of when I was reading the paragraph for the first time when I was like 12 and I was sitting in class reading it and I just thought that just made this reading experience so much more enjoyable because I had this air of nostalgia but also like a relaxation sort of feeling in my head because you know when you'd be in school and you'd be allowed to read for like five or ten minutes while the teacher was off doing something I used to love that. That was like my favorite part of school. That and being able to put your head down on the table for a bit, for like the bit bit of a cat nap. Those were my two favorite things about primary school. Reading this was like a very relaxing experience, but I read the bulk of it in one day. I spent like six and a half hours reading one day. And to be fair, I probably could have gotten through it a bit quicker. I kept stopping for snacks and going downstairs and kind of procrastinating, watching a bit of TV, coming back upstairs. But um, I got it done. And I'm very excited to continue like with the Lord of the Rings series now for the rest of the summer. I've been meaning to reread The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings series for such a long time that I felt like I'm never going to get around to it. And I ended up giving this four stars. Then I read The Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. So I was a bit iffy reading more fantasy on the heels of The Hobbit. But in reality, I was like in the best headspace for it because I was like on such a buzz off of reading Hobbit um, that I was going to basically I thought I was like I'd appreciate this more because I'm in that headspace now. Um, So this is about a young boy called Fitz. Now when we first get introduced to Fitz he's like six years old and off the bat I was like oh great. I didn't realize he was going to be that young but he does age up quite quickly over the course of the book. So I think by the time um, it's finished he's like 13 or so. He's definitely like in his early teens by the end of it. So Fitz is a a boy who's born out of wedlock but he is uh, the son of a king And he ends up living with the mother. Eventually the mother and her family are like sick of having him around and they send him off back to the king now. So the king doesn't take him back immediately. He becomes like a stable hand or a stable boy, but he's under the supervision of the king basically. And Fitz starts demonstrating that he has magical abilities. So there's this thing called the skill and the skill is basically to be able to communicate telepathically with one another. So they use it in battle so that the higher-ups can command their army without having to actually go 
you know, send someone down and to deliver messages. They can just go right into someone's head. So that's what it's basically used for. Fitz also has something which is referred to as the wit, which is really looked down upon. It's very taboo if you have it. Like if you have it, you're not supposed to meant to use it. It's just very like, ugh. Um, basically that's the skill of being able to communicate with animals and it's not in the way that I thought it was going to be like you know the animals are fully talking back to him or anything like that it's more like an, an emotional a really strong emotional connection so he gets trained up in the skill and he becomes an assassin and it happens really quickly like one thing I, I, I liked and I disliked about this was the pacing like it it's so so quick um, I was expecting a bit more character development before we got into the uh, like assassin apprentice part of it, but that happens very, very early on. Um, and I'm sure some people would really enjoy that, but I just thought the pacing was a bit, bit off. Overall, I felt like even the ending, it didn't like there's, you know, this is part of a trilogy. So I didn't feel like it hooked me in at the end. Like I don't feel massively drawn to pick up the next one, even though I hear that the second book is when stuff starts getting really good. I don't know. I just thought that there'd be more of a like, oh my God, I need to pick up the second book now. I need to find out what happens next immediately. There really wasn't that sort of feeling for me when I finished it. The other thing that really irritated me while I was reading it is because of Fitz being born out of wedlock, his, his name isn't capitalized. So it's a small F and it just, it bothered the hell out of me. Like the grammar nerd in me was was so bothered like I get why they're doing it yeah I understand but still I was like hmm but yeah I think overall I think I gave it like three stars I enjoyed it for what it was like it was a bit of fun it's a nice break from the heavy things that I usually like reading so um yeah it wasn't all bad but um I thought it would just be a bit more engaging than it actually was the next book that I picked up was The Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller so loads of people told me when I hauled this that like Henry Miller wasn't a super likable person. He's really misogynistic and anti-Semitic and all that kind of thing. And he definitely is. After reading that, he definitely is. But the reason why I wanted to read some of his work is the fact that Henry Miller has inspired a lot of authors that I really enjoy. And I've heard him reference time and time again. So I've always just wanted to find out what is it that was so special about his writing that inspired a lot of people? And if you don't know, Henry Miller inspired a lot of the Beat Generation writers. It, it was really um, prominent how how his writing has inspired Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and all, all those guys. Um, also, just referencing back to the crumb bum lifestyle, there's a lot of that in this. Henry Miller is actually living in France and it, again, stressed me out to no end. He does a lot of sort of odd, odd jobs and... While I was reading this, I was very heavily procrastinating from doing my thesis. And at a certain point, he ends up being um, getting a job uh, writing somebody else's thesis for them. Um, like he's been dictated it. And I was just like, there's no escape. There's literally no escape. I'm constantly being reminded of like, you need to do your work. <laughs> so I thought this was quite interesting. Like now I did have a massive issue with the misogyny because at a certain point, like, well, not, not even with the misogyny. I didn't like the sex scenes that were depicted in it but because I just don't really like sex scenes in general. Like if there's going to be sex scenes in a book, I naturally skin o skim over them because it makes me uncomfortable. I'm kind of like, oh, I shouldn't be reading this. I shouldn't be knowing this kind of thing about Henry Miller. I don't want to know. At a certain point, he just starts referring to women and like his friends do it as well as the C word. There's not even like a name given to them. They, they're just referred to as the C word, which is bothersome. And also Henry Miller has a wife. At a certain point, he's like, I wonder how my wife is doing back in America. I'm like, yeah, because he's just doing all this sort of carry on when he's over in Paris. It's so gross. But some of it was actually pretty funny. There was moments that I actually had to laugh out loud um, where he is also quite self-deprecating, which I appreciated it. Like he knows he's naturally flawed because he's American. I'm saying that in a much nicer way than he said it in the book, but I appreciated how he can understand how Europeans look at Americans and all that kind of thing. But yeah, overall, I think I gave this three stars as well. There was a lot of three star reads during this period, but um, I wouldn't be... I mean, I wouldn't be rushing to read another novel by him, but I would never dismiss him. Like, I wouldn't mind reading more of his work in future. But yeah, there was just some things in this that I was like, I really, I don't like. <laughs> so after that, I basically had finished my TBR. So I was just picking up random things off my bookshelf. So I decided to read Sybil by Flora Retta Schreiber. So this is like a super controversial book in the sense of it's about a woman who has um, split personality disorder. Uh, or multiple personality disorder. She has 16 different personalities, 
but the controversy is that no one knows whether it's true or false. I was actually, after I read it, I was looking it up and the woman who it's based on said initially like, oh no, I lied about everything. It's not true. And then she's come out again and said like, oh, well, actually I did ha I did suffer from it at the time. So I don't really know what to believe. Also, there's like the question of whether this is even ethical because the doctor's writing about a patient, you know, you're not really supposed to be doing any sort of thing like that. It's all supposed to be private. Um, so yeah, this is quite controversial, but it's written in third person, which I thought was quite interesting because I thought it was going to be a first person account, um, but it wasn't. And I think because it was written in third person, it was much easier to read. It just, you know, it read like a novel. But at a certain point when it's revealed why Sybil suffers from what she suffers from, and I should have expected it because anyone with this kind of condition usually has a lot of childhood trauma, but like this is child called it levels of childhood trauma like it absolutely horrific depictions of uh, torture and stuff I would say that to anyone who's going to be thinking of picking it up just brace yourself for it because it is really graphic it, it, it's really horrible but for some reason or other I just I couldn't really put it down I was just glued to this while I was reading it um, and I ended up really enjoying it for what it was I thought I was going to end up giving it like one or two stars when I initially picked it up from what people had told me about it when I said I was interested in reading it. But yeah, I ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. And then after that, I decided to pick up The Divine Comedy by Dante. So I just grew big balls out of nowhere and decided, listen, I'm just going to give it a read. I'm going to read The Inferno and see how I get along with it. And then if I get along okay with it, I'll read the rest of it. So it, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty big. I was relying heavily on the uh, index in the back to understand what was actually happening uh, because I don't get a lot of the biblical references and that really screwed me over for the Paradiso bit. I, I think that was the bit that I, I disliked the most because I had to reference so much. Um, one thing that I did really enjoy about it is that the fact that I have a quite a good knowledge when it comes to Greek mythology. So all the Greek mythology references, I was like, a okay, I did not have to look at the back, but for the majority of this, I had my finger in the back in the index ready to go and I was just flipping back and forth constantly. I went through all the motions with this. Like at first it was, I was just kind of like, you know, getting my footing with uh, Inferno and just trying to get used to the pacing of it and all that kind of thing. And then when Purgatorio started, I felt like, yeah, I found my footing with it now. I feel confident with it now. Um, I understand some of the references, so I'm not constantly having to look in the back. But then when Paradiso started, I just felt like a dumbass all over again. So I really just went through all the emotions and uh, it was a really interesting experience. Like I do feel like a lot of the stuff in it did go over my head. However, looking at reviews that people have said about it on Goodreads, I feel like a lot of people have had that experience with it. I can reread this in the future. This isn't like the one and only chance I get to read it and then I never get to read it again. I can reread it in 10 years and realistically I will have a much better uh, grasp of what's happening in the story and what's been referenced uh, because there's a lot of references. There's a lot of references. I'm glad that I actually read it because, you know, I was saying that I was thinking of maybe putting it off for another year or two. So now that I've just gotten it out of the way, I just feel a little bit happier within myself. And then finally, the last book that I read was Gyo by Jinji Ito. So I did a full review of this. If you're interested in watching that and hearing about this in more depth, I will leave a card to that so you can check that out. But it is about a young couple who are on holiday and while they're on holiday, the girlfriend starts complaining about a bad smell and she thinks it's her boyfriend and she even accuses him of like, having bad breath and not washing properly and all this kind of thing. And she insists on getting back into the shower and having a second shower of the day just in case it's her because she can't figure out why the smell is so bad. And it's regarded as like a death stench. Like it's just a ferocious uh, vomit, nausea inducing scent. Um, and when she's in the shower, she like hears something and she looks around and she just sees what she refers to as a monster and faints. So her boyfriend like comes back and checks on her and finds her unconscious and figures out, you know, what's going on. And what the monster actually was, was a fish on legs. So basically it is a story of um, Japan being invaded by these fish on legs. And it's not just fish, it's like whales and sharks and all this kind of thing. Any sort of sea life, they're on legs, but they're not alive, they're dead. And they're giving out this horrible stench. 
and um, it's making people sick. So it's a really, really fun story. Um, Junji Ito, if you've never read any of his work, it's, you know, it's horror, but it's, this is more like sci-fi horror. It's so much fun. Um, the artwork is impeccable. It's stunning in moments and then it's absolutely horrific at other times. Like it, it can be so graphic and just nightmare inducing. If you're someone who loves horror and you've never checked out any Junji Ito, I absolutely recommend it. This is one of my favourite books that I've read so far this year as well. So those are all the books that I read during springtime. Let me know if you've read any of them and what your thoughts are or if you're planning to read any of them. Let me know what you read over this time that you think I might be interested in checking out and I hope you enjoyed this video and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.